Okay. So last time we were looking at Hume's scepticism, specifically with regard to the external world, and we looked in particular at sections 142 and 144. What I'm going to do today is fill in some of the gaps and go through other uh, sections within Treatise 1, Book 3, Part 4. Um, and uh, we'll see there uh, that Hume is going to look at sceptical issues with regard to reason, the soul, and the self. Next time, I'm going to be going on to the conclusion uh, of Book 1, Part 3. That's where we will see the... Um, I'm sorry, I'm screwing this up. Can I start again? I'm sorry. It's all right, I just carry on. <coughs> I'm, I'm getting the parts all muddled in my head, aren't I? It's silly. Never mind. Put it down to lack of sleep. Right. <coughs> okay. So, last time we looked at Hume's scepticism, specifically with regard to the external world. Uh, and that was focusing, therefore, on Book 1, Part 4, Sections 2 and 4. Today we're going to be going through the intervening sections within Book 1, Part 4, uh, and next time we'll be looking at the conclusion, that is Section 7, where all the sceptical worries come together. So what I'm going to be trying to do is make sense of Hume's scepticism so that we can see both the problems that he was addressing in the treatise and how he came to deal with them uh, in the end. It's potentially quite a confusing picture, but I think we can make reasonably good sense of it. So, today we're going to look at scepticism with regard to reason, uh, Hume's discussion of the soul, and of personal identity. Now, <coughs> the scepticism with regard to the external world that we saw last time was disturbing enough. Uh, we saw uh, that in 142, he starts relatively complacent. Uh, we can take for granted that there's an external world, and we, we, indeed we have to take that for granted. But he ends up wondering whether he's got any reason at all to believe in an external world. In Treatise 144, he concludes that there's a direct and total opposition betwixt our reason and our senses. But Treatise 141 and 146 are, if anything, even more disturbing, as we'll see. Now, just to put these um, in context, um, we, he's leading up, as I said, to Treatise 147, which is the conclusion, and in that conclusion, he's going to draw together and refer back to these various sceptical worries. But part of the problem in interpreting all this is that he does all this discussion in a sort of stream of thought form. So, just as we saw in Treatise 142, he starts off one way and then seems to change his mind. Uh, we see that even more in 147. And <clears throat> so it's good to keep in mind the structure of Book 1, Part 4. Um, scepticism with regard to reason, that's the section we're about to look at, actually comes first before scepticism with regard to the senses. Then we have the three sections we looked at last time on the external world. Then we get the stuff on the soul and the self, and then the conclusion. Now, it looks, as you read through the treatise, it looks as though Hume's intention in section one is mainly to back up the conclusions he's already come to about induction. Remember, when he was discussing induction, Hume's conclusion was that belief uh, is more to do with the feeling than with cogitation. We find ourselves believing certain things, uh, not on the basis of some process of ratiocination. Uh, at the end of section one, he's going to draw a similar conclusion. Then he goes through the external world, finding all sorts of problems with it, and it looks as though he starts out in section five and six again, rather more optimistic. He expects that his discussion of the internal world, as he puts it, uh, what we are inside, is not going to reveal any contradictions. Um, and then we find later on, he finds, oh dear, with regard to the personal identity, he does encounter some problems. And then in conclusion of this book, uh, 
it's as though he talks about setting out on the sea in a leaky, weather-beaten vessel. He's realised that his reason is something that it's rather hard to rely on on the basis of all this scepticism, uh, and he's desperately trying to keep afloat, and we'll see his efforts to do that. OK, so scepticism with regard to reason. As I said, this is actually the first section of Treatise uh, Book 1, Part 4, but in the conclusion it turns out to be possibly the section that is most disturbing. Now, it contains a famous and very radical sceptical argument, but it does seem quite a problematic one. The first stage of the argument, well, let's take for granted that, as he puts it, in all demonstrative sciences, the rules are certain and infallible. So suppose you do a mathematical proof. The rules you're using, the mathematical rules you're using, or a proof of logic would be the same kind of thing, assume that those rules are perfectly certain and infallible. We know that those work. Nevertheless, when we apply them, we're apt to make mistakes. Even the best mathematician sometimes makes mistakes. So when you do a mathematical proof, you can't actually be 100% certain that you've done it right, even if the rules that you're supposed to be using are, in fact, completely above reproach. So knowledge, that's knowledge in the strict sense, degenerates into probability. There's always some element of uncertainty because of our fallibility. OK, so how do we adjust to that? Well, we ought always to correct the first judgment derived from the nature of the object, that is, the mathematical judgment, by another judgment derived from the nature of our understanding. So if we're being rational, when we go through a mathematical proof, we shouldn't be 100% certain. We should reflect on the fact that there's an uncertainty that derives from our own faculties and adjust accordingly. But then, how good are we at judging the reliability of our own faculties? Hume said that we've got to do that. We've got to reflect on our own reliability. Uh, but then, when we reflect on our own reliability, how reliable are we at making that judgment? Um, that itself is subject to error. So we're obliged by our reason to add a new doubt derived from the possibility of error in the estimation we make of the truth and fidelity of our faculties. We should go on and make another judgment. And that, Hume claims, can only weaken the evidence that was left by the first judgment. This decision, though it should be favourable to our preceding judgment, being founded only on probability, must weaken still farther our first evidence, and must itself be weakened by a fourth doubt of the same kind, and so on in infinitum. And even the vastest quantity must in this manner be reduced to nothing. All the rules of logic require a continual diminution, and at last a total extinction of belief and evidence. So the idea seems to be something like this. Imagine that you start off with complete assurance, but then there's an element of doubt. Let's suppose you're 99% confident of your judgment. Well, in that case, you shouldn't be absolutely certain your judgment should be 99%. But then what about your estimation of your own reliability? Maybe that's only 99%. So it looks almost as though Hume is saying, well, you multiply the 99% by the 99%, that reduces it a little bit more. And then you've got to make a similar judgment about that judgment, which reduces it a bit more, and a bit more and a bit more, and you go on and on forever, and eventually it comes down to zero. If you multiply 0.99 by itself enough times, it will go down uh, to an infinitesimal amount. So does Hume accept this argument? He's put forward an argument saying that rationally we shouldn't even believe the result of a mathematical calculation. Even if we're doing something in mathematics or logic where the rules are completely infallible, uh, because of that iterated doubt about our faculties, we shouldn't believe the result. Should it be asked me whether I sincerely assent to this argument and whether I really be one of those skeptics who hold that all is uncertain and that our, that our judgment is not in anything, even in mathematics, possessed of any measures of truth and falsehood, I should reply that this question is entirely superfluous, and that neither I nor any other person was ever sincerely and constantly of that opinion. 
Nature, by an absolute and uncontrollable necessity, has determined us to judge as well as to breathe and feel. So, as I said, here he is backing up what he's earlier argued with regard to induction. We can't see any reason at all for supposing that the future will resemble the past, but that doesn't actually affect our reasoning because we can't help believing that the future will resemble the past. Nor can we evermore forbear viewing certain objects in a stronger and fuller light upon account of their customary connection with a present impression than we can hinder ourselves from thinking as long as we are awake or seeing the surrounding bodies when we turn our eyes towards them in broad sunshine. Whoever has taken the pains to review, refute the cavils of this total scepticism has really disputed without an antagonist. So he's put forward an extreme sceptical argument, saying rationally we shouldn't believe anything, even in mathematics. And now he's saying, nevertheless, I don't follow the conclusion of this argument any more than I do in the case of induction. Uh, you know, we can't help if we see A followed by B again and again. We see an A, we just find ourselves believing a B. Okay? We can't forbear doing that on account of the customary connection with a present impression. We have the present impression of an A, we just find ourselves inferring a B. And he seems to be implying that exactly the same sort of thing goes on when we think about logic and mathematics. Uh, from a strictly logical, rational point of view, we shouldn't even believe the results of a mathematical calculation but we can't help doing so. My intention then, in displaying so carefully the arguments of that fantastic sect, that is the skeptics, is only to make the reader sensible of the truth of my hypothesis that all our reasonings concerning causes and effects are derived from nothing but custom, and that belief is more properly an act of the sensitive than of the cogitative part of our natures. I have proved that if belief were a simple act of the thought without any peculiar manner of conception or the addition of a force and vivacity, it must infallibly destroy itself and in every case terminate in a total suspense of judgment. So Hume at this point is putting forward this extreme sceptical argument rather peculiarly to back up, as it were, a, a scientific claim about how we behave, that our beliefs are determined by feeling rather than by rational considerations. But why doesn't Hume apply this same argument to his own philosophical reasoning? I mean, how can he get round it? Why is it that he doesn't follow the argument through? Well, his answer is that after the first and second decision, the action of the mind becomes forced and unnatural. The ideas faint and obscure. Though the principles be the same, yet their influence on the imagination weakens. So the reason why we don't actually follow through the reasoning, even though Hume himself is a, obviously a great believer in philosophical reasoning in general, here he's saying this particular argument, although it's a strong argument for scepticism, he thinks we can't actually follow it through because if we try to do so, we sort of lose a grip. And I think you can see there's something in this. I mean, imagine yourself doing some complicated mathematical sum. Maybe you're, maybe you're doing it in some test. And you might think to yourself, is it worth going back and checking my answer? And you might think, well, I normally get these right 99% of the time. Well, just in case, I'll go back and check. Now, suppose a little voice in your head was supposed, occurred to you and said, well, wait a minute, how reliable are you at judging how often you get it right? Hmm, and you might think, hmm, maybe it's not 99%. Maybe I'm not so sure about that. My memory isn't always so good. And now imagine another little voice in your head saying, yeah, how reliable do you think you are at judging the reliability of your judgments? And at this point, you begin to lose grip. And how reliable are you at judging the reliability of your judgments about the reliability of your judgments? You can see after three or four iterations, it becomes very, very hard to focus on what the question is. And Hume seems to be saying, that saves us. We, we find ourselves unable to go on iterating. 
So we're saved from total scepticism only by a rather trivial property of our minds, the fact that we cannot go on reasoning deeper and deeper and deeper. And as we'll see, this ultimately raises doubts about Hume's response to scepticism. We'll be seeing that um, particularly next time. But let's go back and ask how strong Hume's argument is. He's put this supposedly devastating sceptical argument, is it actually a good one? Well, again, think about the case where you've done a mathematical problem and experience suggests that you get these kinds of things right 99% of the time. And now it occurs to you that this estimate might be wrong. Right? I, I reckon I get this wrong about 1% of the time. Hang on, that little voice, are you sure it's 1%? No, I'm actually not sure I'm, it's 1%. But come to think of it, it might be less than 1%. Might be more, might be less. Why should the thought that I am not sure about how often I go wrong, why should that reduce my confidence in my original judgment? Because my estimate might be a pessimistic one rather than an optimistic one. I might actually only go wrong one time in a thousand. It's just that I specially remember the times when I've gone wrong because it's been such a, a disaster, maybe. So it's not at all clear that questioning your judgment about your reliability should be a reason for being less confident in your reliability. What really matters, perhaps, or it seems tempting to say, what really matters is what that true proportion is. And if it's 99%, well, it's 99%. If it's 98%, so be it. Maybe I'm misremembering it. But why should we imagine that questioning it and questioning it again and questioning it again should drive it down and down and down? There is a certain proportion of times that I go right, and whatever it is, as long as it's up in the 90s, I've got good reason uh, for my judgment. Now, <clears throat> some people have tried to defend Hume by saying, well, okay, I may agree that um, making, questioning one's judgment about one's reliability doesn't necessarily force the reliability down and down and down, but what it does do is lead to a kind of spreading of the probability. But again, I think the case for iteration is quite weak. Um, if it's my track record in judging mathematics that matters, if it's my mathematical ability and reliability that is in question, why should it matter in the least bit if I'm bad at judging my own reliability? That's a different question. That's a question of my judgment about my own cognition, not about mathematics. So it's not clear that Hume has given a good reason for iterating in this way. Okay, so 141, I conclude, gives a rather dubious argument for scepticism. It's an argument which Hume in the treatise, at any rate, takes seriously. Uh, we'll see that in the inquiry he drops it, and perhaps a good thing. We'll see that it comes back to haunt him in 147 at the conclusion of Book 1, Part 4. But for now, let's put that on one side and move on to Hume on the soul, which is much less negative, uh, but it, it prepares the ground for Hume's discussion of personal identity. So this is section 145 of the immateriality of the soul. It's a long and quite complex section. I'm just going to be picking out a few highlights and try to give you a, a sort of overview of it so that if you go and read it through, uh, you'll be able to keep some orientation on where Hume's going. Now, I mentioned that he starts off saying that the intellectual world, the world of the mind, though involved in infinite obscurities, is not perplexed with any such contradictions as those we have discovered in the natural. So notice he's saying again quite explicitly that he's discovered contradictions in our view of the external world. And he's anticipating that no such contradictions will arise in his investigation of the mind. 
OK, then, so a quick whistle-stop tour through um, the bulk of this section. At the beginning, he attacks the idea of mental substance and the notion of inhesion. Um, and here he appeals to the copy principle. So we, we're familiar with the copy principle. All ideas are derived from impressions. Where is the impression from which you can derive the idea of substance or inhesion? OK, because the properties of the mind are supposed to inhere in some mental substance. Uh, neither of those ideas makes any sense. So the question of the substance of the mind doesn't make any sense because we don't actually have an idea of substance. Then he moves on to a, another issue, the about the location and the extension of perceptions. Now, a crucial point here is that Hume divides the types of perceptions into two different kinds. We've come across this before in 142. Uh, perceptions of sight and touch, Hume takes to have some kind of spatial location. Uh, whereas other perceptions, like smell, doesn't have a spatial location. He thinks it's an error to attribute smell to physical objects. Um, and he, but he, talks, he says it's a very natural illusion. Um, another example is taste. Uh, he thinks that if we smell or taste a fig, and we're aware of the, the physical properties of the fig through sight and touch, we very naturally mix them together. And we naturally think that the smell and the taste also belong with, physically within the fig. But he says that's a mistake. And if you remember, when we were discussing Hume on um, causation, he alluded to this passage there. There's a footnote in 1314.25 where he says, when you attribute power to the object itself, it's a bit like attributing taste to the fig itself. Or at least the linkage seems to be quite explicit there. Then in quite a large chunk of this section, uh, paragraph 17 to 28, he embarks on a discussion which is really rather puzzling. And I suspect here that he's having a bit of fun. He's, he's observed an interesting conflict or tension between the views of orthodox people who on the one hand hate Spinoza, describes Spinoza as putting forward a hideous hypothesis, but on the other hand, believe in a simple soul. Okay, so what's so awful about Spinoza? Well, Spinoza basically thinks that the universe is a single thing, nature or God. And everything within nature is just a modification of that one thing. So he's a kind of pantheist. He identifies God and nature. Uh, but most people at the time thought of him as an atheist because he didn't think of, he didn't believe in a God that was anything like the kind of God they believed in. So there were all sorts of arguments against Spinoza about how th this is completely ridiculous. There's no way that physical things can be just the modification of one simple substance. But then Hume says, on the other hand, these same orthodox people are very fond of saying that the human soul is a simple, uncompounded substance, a spiritual substance. In which case, they think of the ideas and impressions that we have in our minds as modifications of that one simple substance. Well, isn't there a big parallel there? That just as the physical objects in the world are, are supposed by Spinoza to be modifications of the one world substance, these theologians all say that our ideas are modifications of the one soul substance. And Hume is playing on that. He's, in a, in a sense, giving a parody argument. And I think it's not absolutely clear how sincere he is here. Um, he, some of his arguments here give the impression that he may be getting carried away by that parallel, as I say, having a bit of fun by taking the theologian's arguments against Spinoza and turning at them against the theologians themselves. Now, I think the most important part of 145, and the part that I would very strongly advise you to read, is the part that follows. It's just the, the last seven or eight paragraphs of the section. 
Now, at this point, Hume turns quite explicitly from discussing the substance of the soul to discussing the causes of thought. And he says, well, here is a question that we can at least address. Let's address it. And he discusses the argument that we mentioned back in lecture one, the, the argument against Hobbes, all these people who'd lined up to say that matter cannot cause thought because thought is so different from matter. And here is the passage that we saw back in lecture one. Nothing in the world is more easy to, to, than to refute this argument against Hobbes. We need only to reflect on what has been proved at large, that to consider the matter a priori, anything may produce anything, and we shall never discover a reason why any object may or may not be the cause of any other, however great or however little the resemblance may be between them. This is not a sceptical argument. Hume is now using his analysis of causation quite explicitly to say that there's no reason why materialism can't be right, no reason why motion and matter shouldn't cause thought. Indeed, we find by experience that they are constantly united. We do find that motion of matter causes thought, just as when I raise my arm, I feel it rising or just as when something bashes into me, I feel pain. Which being all the circumstances that enter into the idea of cause and effect, we may certainly conclude that motion may be and actually is the cause of thought and perception. As the constant conjunction of objects constitutes the very essence of cause and effect, matter and motion may often be regarded as the causes of thought as far as we have any notion of that relation. So notice that here in Book 1, Part 4 of the Skeptical and Other Systems of Philosophy, in this particular part of it, the argument isn't sceptical at all. Here it's a positive argument, an argument for the possibility of a materialistic science of the mind. No reason why matter can't cause thought. Now he does actually spell this out very explicitly, and I think I'm going to come back to this next time as well. But it's very, very important, this passage, I think, and the next one, for thinking about Hume, Hume's account of causation. So in discussing the Hobbesian argument, he comes out with a dilemma, and then he's going to argue for the second horn of it. There seems only this dilemma left us, either to assert that nothing can be the cause of another, but where the mind can perceive the connection in its idea of the objects, or to maintain that all objects which we find constantly conjoined are upon that account to be regarded as causes or effects. So remember the people he's arguing against. The people he's arguing against say, matter can't cause thought because they're so different. Matter and thought, we can't see any connection there. And Hume's saying, well, you've got a dilemma here. Are you going to say that nothing can cause anything else except when we can see a connection? Well, in that case, actually, you're going to come to the conclusion that nothing can cause anything. So you better go the other way. You better maintain that all objects that, sorry, I'll go back, that all objects which we find constantly conjoined are upon that account to be regarded as causes and effects. And he, he draws that conclusion quite explicitly. Okay. So we see here at the end of 145 that he is applying his discussion of causation in a positive way. And we'll see later that he does this again. So I'll be coming back to passages on liberty and necessity next time. And notice that these are positive results rather than skeptical ones. Now, the, this is just something in, in, in passing. Um, it's very interesting that the, in the very final paragraph of 145, uh, we have a, a slightly puzzling reference to the immortality of the soul. And I think this can shed a little bit of light on what's going on in this final part of um, uh, Treatise Book One. We, we have a letter to Henry Hume in 1737. So this is, Hume has come back from France with the manuscript of the treatise, and he's writing to his kinsman, Henry Hume, and he encloses with it some discuss a little discussion concerning miracles, which he says he had thought of publishing with the rest. 
but he's decided not to, and he's castrating his work, that is, cutting off its noble parts. Uh, uh, he, he's getting rid of the discussion of religious topics in order not to offend various people, notably Bishop Butler. And it's interesting that it, at this point that we get a little discussion of the immortality of the soul. We get a mention of it, which doesn't appear anywhere else. And there is an essay which was published posthumously by Hume on the immortality of the soul, a very nice little essay, actually, well worth reading, um, which seems to belong somewhere here. And that gives an interesting perspective on, on what Hume is doing here. Um, I do recommend look, uh, reading that essay. If you've got my edition of The Inquiry, it's actually in there. It's a beautiful epitome of Hume's, uh, how Hume's scepticism and positive views tie together. Um, as we've seen in the case of the immateriality of the soul, he uses what looks like a sceptical discussion of causation to actually draw positive results, but of course results that are very unfriendly to religion. Okay, then finally now we're going to go through personal identity. And I'm not going to discuss this in huge detail. Um, personal identity is a particularly problematic topic in Hume, um, partly because, as we'll see, he fundamentally seems to have changed his mind about it. Um, moreover, this is the only place where he discusses it in the treatise. He never, he never mentions it in any work after the treatise. So you can't, as in the case of induction and causation, you can't sort of triangulate with the inquiry and see what his mature view was. And as a result, there's a real puzzle about it. Okay, so what he's trying to do is get clear on our idea of the self. Uh, where does that come from? What's its nature? Well, yet again, he uses the copy principle. Um, conventionally, the idea of the self is endowed with a perfect identity and simplicity. Again, as we found in the discussion of Spinoza, the thought is that the, the, the soul, the self, is a, is a simple entity that retains its identity through time. But actually, when we look inside ourselves, we don't find any impression from which such an idea could be derived. When I look inside myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure, I never can catch myself at any time without a perception, and never can observe anything but the perception. So we look inside ourselves, we're aware of things going on in our mind, but we're not aware of our mind itself. So it looks as though the only genuine idea of self is going to be nothing but a bundle or collection of different perceptions which succeed each other with an inconceivable rap rapidity and are in a perpetual flux and movement. The mind is a kind of theatre where several perceptions successively make their appearance. There is properly no simplicity in it at any one time, nor identity indifferent. The comparison of the theatre must not mislead us. They are the successive perceptions only that constitute the mind, nor have we the most distant notion of the place where these scenes are represented. So all we know of ourselves is the impressions and ideas, that is the perceptions that come to us uh, and that we can reflect on. But since we, we never catch ourselves, we never see the, the place where these impressions and ideas belong, we only see the impressions and ideas themselves, um, all we can think of when we think of ourselves is a sort of bundle of perceptions. Now, you could take this two ways. You could be inclined to say, well, okay, that's all we know of the self, but maybe there is some underlying self which somehow, gives, somehow does hold the perceptions. And maybe we could speculate that there is such a self as it were behind them. But notice that Hume's got difficulty here because of his copy principle. Remember his account, his attack on the notion of substance and inhesion. We don't have any idea of substance other than a bundle of properties because we don't have any impression from which, which that idea could be derived. 
So if you try to speculate about a something in which these perceptions inhere, you're making a completely meaningless speculation. You don't even know what you mean. So Hume is pretty much driven by the copy principle to run epistemology and metaphysics together, to say that all we can think about is what we can know about. So we can't even form the hypothesis of a something I know not what, uh, which, which will serve the job as a soul. So in this, in this section, you find um, the epistemology and the metaphysics come very closely together. And sometimes it, it, it's very hard to distinguish them. So Hume's going to say that it's actually a mistake. It's not a, it's not a question of ignorance. It's actually a mistake to attribute identity to the self. Uh, remember when we were discussing the external world, I made the point that Hume tends to assume that something can only be identical over time if it's completely unchanging. Uh, I think that's a mistake. Most philosophers now would say that's a mistake, but that seems to be Hume's view. So again, just as with the external world, he's in the business of pathology. He's explaining how this mistake comes about. We have a propension to ascribe an identity to the successive perceptions that appear in our mind, and so to suppose ourselves possessed of an invariable and interrupted existence. And he is going to attribute this to the same kind of thing we do in the case of plants and animals and indeed external objects. We're, we're seduced by an easy associative transition of ideas. Remember in the case of the external world, uh, when I look at the bottle, I look away, I look back. Because there's a similarity there between what I see at the beginning and what I see at the end, uh, my mind, my imagination sort of slurs over them and treats them as the same. Uh, when I see a fire burning, uh, over time, sure it changes, it changes in a coherent and expected way. And because my mind naturally follows that uh, transition, I am apt to think of it as a single thing, even though, in fact, it isn't strictly self-identical over that period. So, just as with external objects, we attribute the mind with an ongoing identity, even though that's a mistake. If we reflect on it, we realize it's a mistake, uh, but to resolve this absurdity, we feign some new and unintelligible principle that connects the objects together. Thus, we run into the notion of a soul and self and substance to disguise the variation. So it's very, very similar to what he says about external objects. With external objects, as I say, we see something, we look away, we look back. When we reflect, we realize that the perceptions actually are not identical because of the interruption. That means my original perception of the bottle cannot be that one and the same as my uh, final perception of the bottle. But because I'm so inclined to run them together, I invent a bottle which is supposed to be constant through, through the whole series. And exactly the same thing happens with the mind. Uh, when we think about it, we recognize that our perceptions are not self-identical, so we invent a self uh, to fulfill that role. So, um, some passages here. Again, this is designed really to enable you to read through the section and make sense of what's going on there. Again, we've got a fictitious identity ascribed to the mind of man of a like kind with that which we ascribe to vegetables and animal bodies. And he backs it up with an appeal to the separability principle and the theory of causation. Uh, so here we've got a quotation alluding back to his discussion of causation. The understanding never observes any real connection among objects, and that even the union of cause and effect resolves itself into a customary association of ideas. So when we look at our perceptions, we can't actually see by inspecting them any causal connection, let alone any inherence in some supposed self. So he's simply backing up the claim that simply examining our perceptions doesn't tell us anything about how they may be connected together. Um, now, in explaining, in explaining the illusion with regard to physical objects, uh, contiguity can play a role. When you look at your fire, the fact that 
what goes on in the fire is all contiguous in space and time naturally plays a role into seducing your imagination to thinking of it as a continuing thing. But in the case of the mind, uh, physical cont contiguity can't play any such role. Most of our perceptions have no physical location. Remember, this is something that he said when discussing um, the soul in 145. But memory plays a major role. And here, in explaining how memory plays this role, you can see him as alluding to John Locke's discussion of personal identity. Locke, as you may know, attributed personal identity to continuous consciousness, memory uh, of previous consciousness. And Hume here is, if you like, explaining that away. He's explaining why memory plays such a large role. Okay. So much for 146. The reason why personal identity in Hume is such a conundrum, I mean, that discussion leaves plenty of loose ends and problems and questions to be asked, but the questions are multiplied by the appendix to the treatise that Hume published with Book 3. So at the end of Book 3, you get this appendix. It was published in November, well, very end of October, actually, 1740. The first notices are right, I think it's 30th of October or something like that. So it's, it's 21 months, roughly, after book, Books 1 and 2 had been published. And a lot of the appendix consists of little corrections to be put into books one and two. But he includes also a little discussion about personal identity and uh, notoriously rejects or seems to reject his previous account. Upon a more strict review of the section concerning personal identity, I find myself involved in such a labyrinth that I must confess I neither know how to correct my former opinions nor how to render them consistent. Now the problem here is that Hume explains his difficulty in a way which doesn't make at all clear what it is. Here's his explanation. In short, there are two principles which I cannot render consistent, nor is it in my power to renounce either of them, viz. that all our distinct perceptions are distinct existences and that the mind never perceives any real connection among distinct existences. Did our perceptions either inhere in something simple and individual, or did the mind perceive some real connection amongst them, there would be no difficulty in the case. Problem is, the two, the two principles that he has cited there don't actually contradict each other. All our distinct perceptions are distinct existences, the mind never perceives any real connection among distinct existences. What follows from that? Well, just that the mind never perceives any connection between our distinct perceptions. All right, there's no contradiction there. So why does Hume think that he can't render these two consistent? Very, very unclear. If only Hume had added a few more paragraphs to spell out exactly what his difficulty is. He didn't. And as a result, if you look through discussions of Hume on personal identity, you'll find an awful lot of them are dominated by this difficulty of the appendix, making sense of Hume's second thoughts. What was the problem that Hume identified with his own account of personal identity? We simply don't know. Now, I would say the most popular speculation here is probably that the difficulty is a kind of bundling problem. So, Think of it this way, Hume has explained our illusion of personal identity as arising from the same sort of uh, things that go on in the case of the external world, right? I perceive an external object, as we've seen, I may see it gradually changing, as in the case of plants and animals. Uh, I may look away and look back and see it pretty much the same. In either case, I'm kind of smoothing over gaps in the perceptions joining things together, imagining a continuity where there really is none. Now, in the case of personal identity, that kind of explanation doesn't seem to work quite as well. Because although some of the same things may occur, 
I mean, I feel much the same now as I did five minutes ago. So maybe I'm inclined to think of that as, think of myself as a continuing unity because of that resemblance in my feelings and what I'm perceiving. I mean, I'm still seeing things. I'm getting similar perceptions to those I got a minute ago. So am I seduced into thinking of myself as a unity because of that? Well, hang on a minute. Let's suppose that you and I are somewhere together in a similar place and we're looking over the same scene. Well, there's a resemblance between your perceptions and my perceptions. Am I then seduced into thinking that your perceptions are part of my identity? No, of course I'm not. Why not? Well, because I don't even become aware of them. But then, if there's a difference between your perceptions and my perceptions, to start with, then how can this alleged seduction by similarity actually play any role? It looks as though my perceptions are already mine, I have to be perceiving them in a sequence in order to be seduced by their similarity. In which case the bundling has already to have happened before any such seduction by the imagination can take place. So you can see there's a, there's a problem with Hume's theory. It, it seems if I am seduced into thinking of myself as identical, then there must be an I to start with to be seduced, in which case the identity is already there. Or at least it looks like that's quite a serious problem. Now there are actually quite a range of different problems in this vicinity connected with this bundling idea. And, and I think most people who discuss human personal identity tend to attribute his second thoughts to some kind of awareness of that worry. Um, for further discussion of Hume on personal identity, I think Don Garrett's book is, gives a pretty good account of uh, a range of possible solutions. Um, I think Harold Noonan's uh, book gives a useful chapter on personal identity as well. But we be warned, it's philosophically quite tricky. With regard to Hume's views on personal identity, I, to use Hume's words, pre plead the privilege of a skeptic. Uh, we do only have the one main text plus the bit in the appendix and I really wouldn't want to claim to know what it is uh, that is Hume's puzzle at this point. Okay, next time we'll be drawing all the threads together with the discussion of Hume on scepticism. Thank you.